This is Jesse. This is Sean. And welcome to GenderCast, our trans masculine gender query. Join us as we discuss our journey through gender expression, trans masculine culture, identity, and navigating the binary in our communities. Welcome to GenderCast episode 27. Sean and I are here with Walida Imarisha, who is here visiting Seattle from Portland, Oregon. But Sean and I saw Walida on a panel around prisons and borders that SU's Office of Multicultural Affairs hosted a couple months ago now, I think. And we're blown away and definitely, I thought Walida was the most impactful to me speaker on the panel and just looked at each other after it got over and was like, I want to take a class from her. And Sean's like, we got to have her on the podcast. So we're very fortunate to have coordinated schedules. So just a little bit about Walida before we get going. Walida is a performance poet, part of Good System, Bad System. We'll post a link to that. She also teaches at Portland State University and Oregon State University and is a member of Decolonize Portland. So I think at that, I'm going to turn it over to Sean to sort of introduce the main topic of what we're going to be talking about today. So per usual here with GenderCast, what we're going to do first is read a really <laughs> crappy, not very <laughs> <laughs> encompassing definition of these terms that we'll later criticize and provide some analysis. So in Googling BIC or the prison industrial complex today, I came across the wiki definition. And so I'm just going to read the first paragraph. The prison industrial complex, also known as PIC, is a term used to attribute the rapid expansion of the U.S. inmate population to the political influence of private prison companies and businesses that supply goods and services to government prison agencies. The term is analogous to the military industrial complex that President Dwight D. Eisenhower warned of in his famous 1961 farewell address. Such groups include corporations that contract prison labor, construction companies, surveillance technology vendors, lawyers, and lobby groups that represent them. Activists have described the prison industrial complex as perpetuating a belief that imprisonment is a quick fix to underlying social problems such as homelessness, unemployment, drug addiction, mental illness, and illiteracy. <laughs> <Burr>. <laughs> so now that we have that very shallow look at what PIC means, Walida will go into a lot more depth and we'll start here with what is the PIC? Thank you. That's a very interesting, <laughs> bland, very sanitized definition. You know, I think there are many definitions for the prison industrial complex, but at the core, it is the intersections of the state working with corporations, you know, capital to both make money and also control rebellious populations and rebellious bodies, specifically people of color. And so we can see that the prison industrial complex is rooted in the history of slavery, actually, in this country. And we're, we can talk more about that. But, you know, that definition, I think, is flawed in many ways. <laughs> I think a big one is this idea of shifting the blame to corporations and to capital and to corporate interests and sort of absolving the state of any responsibility. When we look at the history of the prison industrial complex, we see two times in this history where there was an immense growth in the prison industrial complex. One was after the end of legal slavery in this country. The other was in the 1970s when capital was basically abandoned this country, right? This is when all the factories went overseas to exploit third world labor and also where technology stepped in. So suddenly you had a machine to do the job of 10 people, right? We saw rampant unemployment across this country hitting hardest communities of color and black communities. So in some black communities, there was 60 to 80% unemployment in the 70s into the 80s, right? It decimated black communities. And then we see the growth of the prison industrial complex. So in 1970, there were 200,000 people in prison. Today, there are 2.7 million people in prison. That is many, many times the growth that it you know, took to come from the 1700s to 1970s. But both of these are important times for the state, not for corporate interests, right? These are reactions by the state of saying, what do we do? Now we have this newly freed black population. What do we do with them, right? Now we have all of these unemployed, pissed off people who are hungry and angry. You know, as Bob Marley said, a hungry man is an angry man. <laughs> 
And, you know, what do we do? And so I think it's really important to recognize, yes, I mean, corporations are, you know, grabbed that ball, ran to the end zone, spiked it. I don't really know a lot of sports analogies, but whatever the sports analogy is, they just went for it, right? But that is not enough of a reason for the prison industrial complex, right? If we only look at money, if we only look at this idea of prisons are solely there to make profit. Ruthie Gilmore, who's an amazing historian and scholar around this, working with Angela Davis a lot on these issues, really says that if you only look at profit, it doesn't make sense. Corporations don't make enough money to really justify this. There has to be another reason. And so Ruthie Gilmore, Angela Davis, Michelle Alexander, all of these incredible black women scholars actually say that the other reason is control control of potentially dangerous communities who have the potential to radically alter and change our society. And given that the prison industrial complex is rooted in the history of slavery, specifically control of the black community. So the next question that we were going to ask you is the relation and the connection of the prison industrial complex to slavery. And I know that you've already opened up that conversation, but going a step further and talking about the last 400 years and colonization and the fact that we're on colonized land now here in Seattle and the idea of citizenship, geographical borders and ideology and how this relates to communities and populations that are incarcerated. So it's kind of a loaded question, <laughs> sorry. Oh, you just, why are you throwing me all the easy ones? <laughs> So starting with this idea of borders and the, you know, the panel that we did at Seattle University, the pairing of borders and the prison industrial complex, when I first heard it, I was actually like, huh, okay, well, I get, you know, the rise of the criminalization of immigrants. But the more I thought about it, the more I realized this is actually an incredibly important pairing because borders obviously exist as national boundaries, right, as, you know, lines on a map. But really talking about the borders that are put around our identities, right? Our bodies, our movement currently and historically, and how are those borders enforced and policed, right? And when we think about it in that way, we actually see slavery as the ultimate borders where people's every piece and parcel of you, the goal was to police it, to control it, to enforce it, to maintain it, to exploit it, right? So when we talk about colonization, that is about the exploitation of land, of resources, right? The colonizing country comes in, extracts what it wants, and takes it away, right? And uses it and leaves nothing and gives nothing in return. It's a parasite, right? This is what slavery is, right? It's a colonization of black people's bodies, but also of black people's, you know, culture as well. The ways that their culture was criminalized and controlled and systematically eliminated, or at least the attempt was made. So I think it's really important to be able to make these connections because we're seeing a rise in the criminalization of immigrants. We're seeing a rise in for-profit prisons becoming detention centers, you know, basically begging for immigrants to come in so they can get their $300 a day or whatever it is, right? So I think it's an important parallel to be able to talk about the roots of the prison industrial complex as this ultimate border, right? Because it is rooted in slavery. So before the end of legal slavery in this country, prisons were overwhelmingly white. There's a great example actually in Angela Davis's book, Are Prisons Obsolete, where she takes Alabama as an example. And she looks at it and says, um, a few years before the end of legal slavery, Alabama the prison system was overwhelmingly white. And then when you look at it three years later, you see that it's over 90% black. So in three years, we see a complete flip-flop. And the question becomes why, right? And the answer is, well, because obviously slave owners don't want their enslaved black folks to go to prison, right? Because they don't get access to their labor. So there are alternative means of enforcing those borders, right? The slave owners have complete control to enforce those borders and they certainly exercise that. But with the end of legal slavery, the question becomes, how do we enforce these borders, right? These racialized borders upon this entire, you know, newly freed black community that is making demands, is saying, we want 40 acres and a mule. We want representation in Congress. We want schools. We want education, right? Things that the nation was not interested at all in providing. 
So what we see very quickly is the establishment of black codes. These were laws that were written very hastily, specifically criminalizing behavior, but only for black people. So, you know, not having a job was a crime if you were black, right? If you were white, you could kick it all day long. <laughs> but if you were black and you did not have a job, you would be arrested and sent to jail. If you were wanton in speech and conduct, I have no idea. <laughs> and, you know, I mean, again, so vague that anything could be put into that, right? If you were intoxicated in public, right? If you were disrespectful to white folks, any of these things, if you were black, would end you up in jail, right? So you're in jail. And this is actually where we see the beginning of the roots of this tying together of corporate interests wanting to make profit and state interests wanting to keep control because the state would be holding you in the jail. The corporations, right, which at that time were plantations, would lease out convict labor and they would pay the jail to rent you as a black person. And some people ended up going back to the same plantations a few years ago they were enslaved on, but they were now owned by the state instead of owned by a private slave owner. So I think these intersections are incredibly deep. To say that prisons are, you know, the new slavery or the extension of slavery is not a metaphor. It is actually just speaking the truth. Many folks have talked about Michelle Alexander's book, The New Jim Crow, which is an amazing book, and I'm very excited it's out there and getting so much press so we can have these conversations, you know, and bringing forth startling statistics that there are more black people incarcerated today than there were enslaved at the height of slavery. It is the extension of slavery and the same borders that were being policed and enforced during slavery are being policed and enforced in the prison industrial complex. It may look a little different, but it is the same same aims and often the same means. Just as you were talking about the black codes, maybe you can expand a little bit on that and talk about how that relates to the war on drugs. And then the other thing I'm really interested in hearing your take on is the privatization of the jail and prison industry, especially for all you listeners out there, it'd be really interesting for you to look up if your local jails and prisons are ran by the actual governmental entity or if it's been contracted out to a private for-profit corporation because I think that that's happening more and more especially in the south and the midwest from what research I've done. So you know as we talked about the black codes specifically targeted black people and the important thing about the black codes is they created new crimes right it wasn't a crime before to be black and not have a job suddenly this idea of what is a crime changed right it fundamentally shifted and we actually have seen that happen again in the second wave of the immense growth of the prison industrial complex which happened in the 70s where the prison system rose by 400 percent in a matter of a couple decades and we see that rise specifically being tied to the war on drugs right and this idea that the war on drugs suddenly creates a whole set of crimes of things that were not crimes before. To be clear, 70% of people who are in prison today would not have been in prison pre-war on drugs. They would have been given probation. They would have gone to drug treatment programs. They would have not been arrested in the first place. They would have been given a citation, right? The fact that over 80% of the people who are incarcerated today are there for nonviolent crimes, and the majority of those are for nonviolent drug offenses, 70% of which 30 years ago, 40 years ago, would not have been a crime, right? The state, in conjunction with corporate interests, has created a whole new category of things that suddenly are crimes. But they are racialized crimes again so they may not say explicitly it's the black war on drugs as they said with the black codes but it serves the same function again it enforces the same borders whose neighborhood is heavily policed whose neighborhood is occupied right who is being targeted and profiled and pulled in we know that Folks from racial groups do drugs at the same level as their population's numbers, right? So black folks are 13% of the population. We do about 13 to 14% of the drugs, right? But we are twice as likely to be arrested for doing drugs. Mm -hmm. So clearly there is a black code at work there that criminalizes not what we do, but who we are. Racial profiling has nothing to do with, have you done a crime? Do you look like you could do a crime? It says, 
you know, what is your identity? Are you black? Are you brown? Are you trans? Are you queer? Are you deviant? Yes, then you are criminal, right? I think that's a really important point because it challenges this idea of the need for rehabilitation, which I think is a really big conversation. So a lot of times we have the very far, far right folks who, you know, lock them up, throw away the key, gas them, life without parole for 14 year olds, right? This extreme punishment and repressive ideology. And then we're told the other side of the spectrum is folks who want rehabilitation, folks who want to offer drug treatment programs, who want to offer job training programs, who want to show folks who are incarcerated how to go to a job interview and how to present themselves well. And these are well-meaning, well-intentioned things, but they actually reinforce the idea that there is something wrong with folks who are incarcerated. The idea becomes you are broken, you need to be fixed, right? But the reality is folks are there for being who they are, for being black, for being brown. They're not there because they sold marijuana, because there are millions of people selling marijuana out here today, right? There are kids in suburbs across this country <laughs> selling marijuana out of their bedroom room who are never going to face jail time, specifically because of their identity. They are not criminals, therefore that action is not criminal. So I think it's incredibly important that we keep that at the core because Otherwise, we fall into the same racist mythology that supported slavery, right? The ideological support for slavery by white slaveholders was that they were civilizing us. They were civilizing black folks. Without them, we would be savages. We didn't know how to act. And so this was actually a favor they were doing for us where we would come out of slavery better in the end than we went in, right? This is the same ideology for supporting the prison industrial complex, even if we shift it to rehabilitation, because it doesn't dismantle the prison industrial complex. It actually, in some ways, could expand the prison industrial complex, right? Because we, we want to provide even more services. So we need to lock people up even more to make sure that they go to their drug treatment, because you know they won't go to their drug treatment on their own, right? That we can actually see the expansion of the prison industrial complex in this sort of liberal rehabilitation model that is really reinforcing the same racialized ideologies that reinforce slavery. So that makes me think a lot about what we've talked about at different times in this podcast. I know that Toby mentioned walking while trans and also brings to mind a lot of the ID stuff that's happening in Arizona where it's specifically, is it SB 1070? Mm -hmm. Where you have to have an ID on you at all times, but they're only checking people for IDs if they're not white. And also all the post 9-11 surveillance around who getting checked at TSA, who's not able to fly. And again, just based on what nationality you are, what color you are, what class background you have, so that it's an easy way to pull you over and then say that you have done something. Um, but it also brings to mind Angela Davis's PIC essay, which is actually written in 1998. And it's the problem has gotten exacerbated as far as statistics and numbers. But she goes into talking about how we think that prisons like magically fix things in the sense that because we disappear humans, it doesn't mean that we disappear societal problems. So homelessness still exists, even if we're imprisoning folks. Unemployment still exists. All of these things still exist. If we invested the money we invest in the prison system and we actually put them towards unemployment or homelessness or all of these things, then we'd actually have less of a problem. But it's you know not in the best interest of of the state and or corporations. So this is one of the reasons why it still continues. So kind of taking this into a queer and trans sort of lens, one of the things that was going on when we came to the panel is Sean and I are both reading Nat Smith and Eric Standler's Captive Genders, Trans Embodiment in the Prison Industrial Complex. And the episode before this one, we just did an interview with Matilda where we talked a lot about sort of the queer and trans sort of separation from the mainstream LGBT movement. And it kind of reminds me of sort of a reformist and abolitionist movement, because you just talked now between sort of the extreme right and rehabilitation or reformist. And I want to take that further and talk more about the abolitionists. But it's sort of the parallel for me is, no, we don't want to repeal, don't ask, don't tell. We want to actually get rid of the military altogether. And it's like, no, we don't want to try to rehabilitate people. We want to get rid of the prison system altogether. And so I think there's a lot of parallel between stuff that we're talking about sort of through a more I guess queer lens but one of the things that I really wanted to talk about when we invited you on was just sort of talking about the most oppressed groups and people that are experiencing sort of the most violence from the state and from these borders around multiple aspects of their identity across race class age ability and you know gender and then 
you know, going a step further with trans folks, because most institutions, jail and prisons are sex segregated, it's particularly fucked up, I think, for trans people experiencing that, you know, going through that process. So I guess we didn't really ask you to talk about your identity, but please feel free to talk about aspects of your identity. And I know you're not a specific member of the queer community, but kind of just wondering sort of what's your take thinking about the Captain Genders book and talking a little bit about reform versus abolition and then sort of intersections around multiple aspects of your identity. So I think this idea of reform versus abolition is it's a really important conversation. It's also often scary conversation for folks to have and folks often can't even conceptualize of abolition, right? And so I think a lot of times when folks say, well, I want to abolish the prison system, people think they're saying, I want to throw open the doors and let everyone out and abolish the police. And, you know, it's going to be Mad Max and Lord of the Flies and good luck, (laughs) y'all. And that's certainly, you know, not what people, I think the vast majority of folks who call themselves abolitionists are talking about. And I think that even the word abolition is important. It was specifically chosen because it references abolitionists during slavery period, right? So it shows, again, those connections between the prison industrial complex and slavery, but also likens the prison industrial complex to the system of slavery. This idea of saying, you know, no, we can't reform this system. No, it's not something we can tinker with. We can't make a kinder, gentler slavery. We have to abolish it entirely, immediately. And we have to figure out new ways of interacting with one another as human beings. And I think looking back now, obviously, the vast majority of people will say, you know, of course slavery should have been abolished, of course. But that was not the feeling during slavery, right? During those time periods in the antebellum period among white folks, right? It certainly was the feeling among black folks, let's be clear, and other folks of color. But amongst white folks, the majority of white folks felt that if slavery was to be abolished, it was to be abolished because of economics, not justice, right? Slave labor was competing with working class white people labor and you can't compete with slave labor so there's that but there were a large segment of folks who actually said i think that we could gradually abolish slavery i think it you know in a few generations i think we could maybe you know tinker with it and fix it and make it better right and i think that that's the place we're in with the prison industrial complex where that is the prevailing attitude that people have and i truly and honestly believe that in a hundred years folks are going to look back and say wow, of course the prison industrial complex should have been abolished immediately. And why Why was there so much conversation and debate about this? Mm-hmm. It was such a corrupt system. Why didn't they just abolish it in the same way that we say about slavery? But, you know, I think the abolitionist movement is really about finding ways to hold folks accountable and to keep people safe from harm that allows our communities to be whole and healthy and heal, right? And I think that that idea of healing is really important. So it's certainly not that people are not held accountable for the harm they've done to each other because we recognize people do harm to one another and that oftentimes the folks who are survivors of that harm are the folks who are already marginalized within marginalized communities. And so I think, you know, abolitionists have often used a very strong intersectional model because that is the place where in our communities we need to look to make sure that folks are safe and supported and whole. And so if we're talking about, you know, the black community, we're talking about, well, how are black women being treated? How are queer black folks being treated? Trans black folks being treated? How are black children being treated? How are the intersections of all of those folks being treated, right? And how do we hold people accountable when they practice and utilize the dominant culture's ideologies that have been placed upon us? So I personally believe that some of the most incredible resistance to the prison industrial complex is coming out of working class, queer and trans, youth of color movements, because those are the folks who are on the front line every single day, literally, right? And I think the Captive Genders book and queer injustice as well, are so powerful in giving us this framing and being clear and being able to present statistics that, you know, obviously folks know their lived experience, but knowing that the vast majority of queer and trans folks of color experience harassment from police, right? And for folks who see the police as either a benign force or 
a helpful force, it's very hard to understand the gripping fear, what it's like to be scared when you see a police officer rather than feel safe, right? But I think that positionality has really allowed folks to say, we can't reform this system. There is no reformation possible to this system because everything about this system criminalizes every single part of me. And this system designates every single part of my identity as something that should land me in prison for the rest of my life, right? That I should be thrown away for the rest of my life. So I think that folks have really done incredible organizing like Fierce in New York around challenging the immense police presence in the peers in New York, which you know has been a, a haven and a space for queer and trans folks and especially homeless queer and trans youth of color. And the neighborhood became gentrified. We see those connections between the prison industrial complex and policing and the brutality of the state with corporate interests as the neighborhood becomes gentrified, the police intensify their brutality against folks who are undesirables, right? And these amazing youth organizers have been fighting back and organizing back in incredibly creative ways. You know, the Audre Lorde Safe Outside the System project is another incredible example that I tell everyone about preemptively dealing with harm. So it's not just folks have gone to prison and now are out. Obviously, we need to support folks, but how do we engage with that violence before it happens? And so the Audre Lorde Safe Outside the System program is based in a neighborhood in Brooklyn, New York. And there was a lot of harassment and violence against specifically young queer and trans people of color. And the question that Audre Lorde organizers asked was, how do we hold strangers accountable? A lot of this was people coming through the neighborhood. They weren't folks that were there every single day that you could be like, I know your mama, what is wrong with you, right? And what they came up with was saying, it's very difficult to hold strangers accountable. But what we can do is hold our community accountable for all of our safety. Mm -hmm. And so they did an amazing multi-year organizing process where they went to every public institution from the church to the community center, to the school, to the bodega where you get your 40 on the corner, right? To the laundromat and had really intense, difficult, painful conversations about our responsibilities to each other, you know, our responsibilities as communities of color, specifically as black folks, to look out for and support those folks who are the most vulnerable and the most marginalized, right? And dealing with questions and conversations around homophobia and transphobia. And this incredible organizing work resulted in every public institution in that community saying that they would be a safe space. So that if someone is being harassed on the street, if someone feels unsafe, they know they can go into any public institution and that those folks there not only commit to saying, yeah, you can come in here, they commit to saying, no, and I actively will engage with this, you know, and obviously that's going to look different depending on the situation, but their folks created phone trees to be able to call folks and say, you know, we'll call people and suddenly 60 people are outside. It looks really different than two people confronting one person who is intent on doing harm to folks. So I think that this is an amazing example and that it is very much rooted in the identity of queer and trans working class youth of color and their understanding and their perspective from their identity, from that intersection of the identity on the prison industrial complex. And it makes the entire community safer, right? This is not just about supporting, you know, young queer and trans folks of color. It's not as if a woman who was in an intimate violence situation couldn't go into the, no, no, we don't do that here, right? <laughs> that this is making every single person in the community not only safer, but also more empowered to take control. That community has been better organized and able to fight off things like gentrification and the state trying to make cuts to services in their neighborhood because of this work, because they have listened to and supported and taken the leadership of young queer and trans folks of color. So I think it's incredibly important to look at those spaces on the margins in our communities and to move those spaces on the margins to the center, because it's not about doing a favor for you know marginalized people in our community. It's actually about when we center those folks, we improve all of our lives and all of us become safer and healthier and more whole. I do just want to say we'll post links to all the organizations that you referenced. I know we've posted some stuff the Audre Lord Project has been doing. I also wanted to shout out there was this great documentary on PBS called Slavery by Another Name in a very easy, understandable, accessible way, paints that kind of the historic 
development of what we're talking about right now and i think it's really well done so and it's free so if it a chance i would check it out it was definitely a good watch there's also a book that's also called slavery by any other name that goes into more depth if folks are interested once they've seen it and finding out more and and specifically it's focusing on that post reconstruction era in the late 1800s early 1900s where we're talking about the prison industrial complex really solidifying itself as the next phase and incarnation of slavery. So I know that you do a lot of different types of activism and you've had a lot of experience in organizing and you're a poet as well as an educator. So just in my own limited experience around you doing the double life of the nine to five and <laughs> activism outside, in addition to just kind of sometimes waking up and <laughs> seeing that the world is still a mess and I feel like I've done nothing besides <laughs> run on my little hamster wheel. What keeps you motivated as an educator and activist and how do you cope or find balance with kind of like self-preservation as well as, you know, having the energy to continually kind of get up and come into the table again and again and, and trying to uh, make a difference? Well, my work focuses a lot, obviously, on prisons and the history of prisons and the current space of prisons. And I've also done work around anti-militarization organizing, which I feel are very tied together and mm -hmm. You know, Sean, you mentioned the military industrial complex and the prison industrial complex earlier. And I think for especially for young folks of color, post the the flight of capital from communities, the options were go into the military or go to prison, right? Go to prison by selling drugs or engaging in underground economies and doing what is necessary to survive, right? Which will land you in prison eventually or go into the military. So in my head, they're actually not, <laughs> they're not separate. Your body is still policed and enforced and <laughs> controlled by the, by the state through corporate interests. But I think that the ways I stay uh, motivated and engaged are first the connections that I have with people who inspire me. And so I have uh, had the honor of going in and getting to meet with different organizers who are incarcerated, folks who are political prisoners, many of them from the 60s and the 70s, where they were engaged in liberation movement struggles, as well as folks who kind of went in as social prisoners, or as I call them, prisoners of politics and became politicized, became engaged. And so really getting to see folks organize in the worst of conditions possible and still do amazing work. So one of the opportunities I had was actually to organize with a group called DRIVE, which is a group of death row prisoners in Texas who organize against the death penalty. And they organize against the death penalty from their death row cells where they are locked in to a cell that is smaller than a regulation cell for a dog 23 hours a day with the threat of death hanging over their heads and yet they have reached out and engaged with and touched so many folks and my comrade Hassan Shakur who was executed by the state of Texas in 2006 was one of the most incredible organizers I've ever met and you know his last words were keep the struggle alive I believe that you can do this before they shot him full of death in his veins and that is something that motivates me more than i can say to know that he in that moment still had hope and so what right do i have to be to be hopeless um thank you yeah <laughs> so another person who motivates me is my adopted brother, Kekamiya, who's incarcerated in California. And he is has taught me so many amazing lessons about being an organizer. And he creates community wherever he goes. And whenever I go to visit him, he can make a prison visiting room feel like a family reunion. He talks to everyone. Everyone talks to him. He remembers people. He asks about children. He asks about, you know, people's health, you know, how are you feeling? Do you still, have you recovered from that cold you had? Yeah, I have learned so much from him about being an organizer and also about taking people where they're at, I think. He's a black and Puerto Rican queer anarchist, uh, organizer, hoodlum, poet, visionary, <laughs> revolutionary. And his philosophy of organizing is just come on, 
come as you are, come shitty if you have to, like come tore up and we'll deal with it when you get here, but come. I think that's so different than the way that, you know, in the outside movements, these sort of more like professionalized movements, you have to come with your shit together. Like, oh my God, you used the wrong word. I can't ever talk to you again. Talk about <laughs> yeah. The wrong pronoun. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, oh, you don't have this exact perfect analysis of this issue, so you're out, right? Mm -hmm. Or we have a political disagreement on something, so we can't engage or work together. And I think that the most successful movements have said, how do we keep our principles while still meeting people where they're at? And I think that it's something my brother just does organically is in this loving, you know, hilarious way, but still in a very principled way of saying, come on, but just know if you're coming, you got to keep going. You don't just walk over here and stand. We're going to keep walking together. But the point is we'll walk together, right? You know, the Zapatistas say walking while talking, that we can figure it out as we move in the direction, but we have to be talking as we go. So I think I, I don't, yeah, I'm still trying to learn that lesson. <laughs> I feel like Sean and I can relate a lot to that when we started the podcast. One of the things that we experienced a little bit of, whether projected or just our interpretation was what I call social justice elitism and just like not getting it right. Not like when you said not having the perfect analysis, it really resonated for us because there is a really good sense of, I think in the queer community, like a queer politic here that's really strong and there's lots of amazing minds in Seattle that can be really intimidating. <laughs> So I think just trying to understand, but also come to the table with who we are and where we've come from and what we have to offer and then wanting our listeners to learn with us. And one of the things that we always talk about is kind of geographically where we are. And because you're in Portland, I think there's a lot of similarities and, and differences between Portland and Seattle, but sort of that Pacific Northwest privilege and bi-coastal privilege that I think we have around even being able to have these conversations and that there's people you know, available to us to come on this podcast to actually educate us about this stuff versus people that may be in the Midwest or the South, queer and trans communities that may not necessarily have access to that, and some may. And now with the interwebs, I feel like a lot of things are accessible. But I do think there's a different flavor here in the Pacific Northwest. And then we've also got listeners internationally. So we always are trying to think, wow, what it must be like to be in like Brazil right now listening to this podcast. So I was also going to say thank you for being vulnerable with us and talking about people that have impacted you and just sort of how you kind of continue on. I really appreciate that. The idea of, of meeting people where they're at and actually like allowing people to come in and talk about things and make them feel okay with wherever they're at versus if you don't speak my language or if you don't use the exact terms that I want, you're not welcomed here. Your life experiences doesn't have any value or who you are as a person doesn't have any value because you don't think and look and act just like me. There was this great TED follow-up talk, Brene Brown's original thing on vulnerability, and she actually got to the place of vulnerability by studying shame for like decades. Oh, yeah. She's a MSW professor in Texas. And after she got this great reviews on Ted by talking about vulnerability and it leads to happiness, she goes back and says, I really had to like go back to it was shame. And she actually talks about Katrina and how if there was ever a time for this country to wake up about race relations and like what's really happening still, it'd be this time. But be because when we talk about that, we have to then acknowledge our shame. And when shame enters into the thinking or the energy of the conversation we are silenced we don't have a dialogue and i think it's very much with any kind of organizing if you don't know enough then you just don't show up and i think that that's one of the most harmful and divisive things that we've done and i'm sure there's there's a lot of things we could point the finger as to why that happens but i think that that's one of the things as any kind of a community member like to invest to reinvest and come back to the table regardless of if you're prepared, regardless of where you are in life, allyship and being able to show up and see like just person to person oppression and or harm or violence that's done. I think that that's the best thing we can do. So I think this idea of, you know, just engaging with folks and creating these dialogues is one of the foundational pieces of Decolonize PDX, which is an autonomous radical people of color collective in Portland, PDX. And in response to Occupy and some of the conversations that were happening around that, but also in response to the fact that, you know, there is a actual global revolt happening and we as folks of color want to be able to have these conversation and engage in our communities in ways that are useful and helpful and actually empower our communities. 
So one of the projects that we have sort of organically moved into this kind of street performance public conversation thing where my last action was on Occupy the Prisons and we went to the Lloyd Center, which is the mall in Portland, but in the historic black community across from the train station. And we built a mock prison cell that was the same dimensions, six by nine. And we put in the sink and the bunk and all of that kind of stuff. And we hung signs around it that talked about statistics, you know, that 70% of people in prison are people of color, that black women are the highest growing population. Population has risen by 800% in the past 20 years, that the violent crime rate has declined by 25% in the past 15 years. So, you know, really putting these things out. And then we, we had a camera and we just asked passersby to answer the question, looking at the prison cell, does this make you feel safe, right? And we were prepared for some pushback. We, I mean, this was our way of getting to talk about prison abolition in a way that didn't use the words prison abolition and start talking about the prison industrial complex and, you know, all of this. <laughs> Do you have 45 minutes for me to give you a brief history lesson? So, you know, just really asking people, does this make you feel safe? And we did not have one single person who said it made them feel safe. Every single person from all walks of life, you know, dudes, white dude, duty dudes, you know, were... Dude bros! <laughs> yes, the dude bros, you know, were like, no, bro, no, right? <laughs> and, you know, guys in corporate suits and, you know, punk rock kids and folks who shared their own experiences with prison and said, absolutely not, it doesn't make me feel safe because I've been put in that cage. No one said it made them feel safe. Everyone said, putting someone in this space does nothing to make me safer. And in fact, it makes all of us less safe. And I was incredibly inspired by that. And I was inspired by decolonized PDX's ability to open up space to have these conversations that never happen in public, right? One of the other things we did was on New Year's Eve, we rode on the, on the Max, which is the train, and had a picture frame and asked people to hold it up. And there was a question underneath that said, do the cops have the right to murder me, right? And it was in honor of Oscar Grant, who was a young black man who was killed by Oakland police on New Year's Eve in the BART station, the train station, in front of dozens of people who filmed, shot in the back as he lay face down with no weapon, completely defenseless. So we did it in honor of him, in honor of Aaron Campbell and Keith Notis, who were young black men who were killed in Portland, and really asking people, you know, what is the role of police, right? And do we give away authority to the state to have any control over us, to police our borders completely, even to the point of death? And so we got a whole bunch of different kinds of answers. But what was wonderful is while we were, you know, on one side interviewing folks, we could hear this conversation going throughout the entire train. The entire train was talking and arguing and dialoguing about something that we as everyday people are not supposed to have an opinion about, right? Leave that for the politicians, leave that for the experts, leave that for the professionals. And instead folks were saying, no, my brother was beaten by the police. You know, I was beaten by the police. I had a friend who was murdered by the police, you know? And being able to bring those stories out. And I think Sean, like you said, without shame, with actually having a space to say, these are my experiences and it's not shameful. It actually makes me an expert on this mm -hmm. because this is not theoretical for me. This is my lived reality. And so I feel incredibly inspired by those pieces that, you know, as Decolonized PDX, we kind of developed the idea all together and we're like, we have no idea how this is going to go. <laughs> no one may want to talk to us. And instead, you know, we've had just an incredible response because it's clear people want to engage with each other on these issues that affect every single one of our lives. It's that the state has shut down purposefully lock down every single opportunity to have that right so the media and schools and even public transportation all of that is locked down to the point where these conversations are very difficult to have so i think causing ruptures in that creating space where we can have these conversations is an insurrectionary act that actually really reminds me of the two things that i feel like are big right now that are going on and one is the cc mcdonald case that's going on and how often when something is atrocious enough or at least gets some media coverage to like incite people gathering and talking they close down any kind of information so that the trial is a closed trial you can't be present and so that 
they try to mother the conversation altogether from happening. And then also the stuff that's going on in Florida with Trayvon Martin mm-hmm. and how there was a school, Howard, these college kids, and had hoodies and Skittles. And they were like, Does it, do I look like a criminal? Do I look like a criminal? So getting the word out in that way. But had this been different identities where the person that died and the person that did the shooting were different, we'd be having different conversations. But as it were, because it's got as much publicity, rightly so, as it did, this person's on house arrest and just like, oh, well, you don't have to face the public or continue to have these dialogues, but it's exactly the strategy. You know, I think the timing between the Trayvon Martin case in Florida, where hopefully folks know this case, you know, a young 17-year-old black man was killed for being a young 17-year-old black man by an individual who had very strong law and order tendencies, right, as folks keep saying. The fact that this conversation was happening, it happened at the same time as in Portland, Oregon, a young 25-year-old black man, Aaron Campbell, was murdered by police two years ago. And Aaron had lost his brother earlier that day. He had died of heart failure. Aaron was distraught and he was threatening to kill himself. His girlfriend didn't know what to do. She called 911. When you call 911, the police are dispatched. So the police were dispatched and there was a negotiation team, right, that has some semblance of training. There were also snipers set up all around Aaron's house. And so finally, after dialogue and conversation, they got Aaron to come outside. He came out with his hands up. They told him to turn around and walk backwards. He was doing that. They then fired six beanbag shotgun pellets at him in his back and sicked a dog on him as he was following their orders. He moved to grab the spot where he had been shot, which is a normal human reaction. And Ron Frashauer, who was a police officer with a sniper rifle, shot and killed him in the back. So Frashauer was actually fired, which was pretty groundbreaking. And I think it was entirely due to community organizing and mobilization. Both the police chief and the mayor of Portland spoke out and said that he took it too far. But an arbitrator reviewed the case. There's mandatory arbitration. So every time a police officer is fired, and this happens in most cities, there's a mandatory arbitration process. There's never been in Portland a police officer who stayed fired through that mandatory arbitration process for brutality or for murder. So the arbitrator came back and said that the city had to give Fresh Hour his job back. Mm. But the justification is what is incredibly important. What the arbitrator said was, Frashauer was doing his job as he had been trained to do it. You cannot fire him for this because he was doing what you trained him to do in the manner you trained him to do it. I think that's incredibly important because it means Ron Frashauer is not an aberration, right? He is the system functioning as it should. He is what the face of policing should look like according to the system, right? Zimmerman is not some right-wing nut that is completely disconnected and operating on his own. He is, in fact, enacting policing in the exact same way that police act in our communities every single day. So I think it's an incredibly important discussion to have to be able to tie this to institutional oppression and institutional oppression specifically from policing and the prison industrial complex. Because when we're able to see that the system is not broken, it's not a bad apple, right? Exactly. I mean, that's what, you know, decolonized PDX in our founding statement, we said the system is not broken, it's working exactly as it was intended to. So when we see that, we actually have to begin to envision alternatives and different ways of engaging as communities around this and re-envisioning what we feel like justice is. Because the reality is, is if it justice is Ron Frashauer staying fired, it's very unlikely we will ever get that in this current system. If justice is Zimmerman going to prison for the rest of his life, it's very unlikely we will get that in this current system. And at the end of the day, how does that stop you know, more Trayvon Martins from not happening? How does it stop more Ann Campbells from happening? It doesn't. So what we actually need to do is do an actual radical re-envisioning and restructuring of the entire way we conceptualize what is justice. Boom. That'll be the next episode we ask you on. (laughs) 
so into it. I'm like, don't ask me for all the answers. <laughs> <laughs> this is wild. Like, thank God for community organizing. We got to all figure it out. Wow. So we got into this a little bit when Sean was talking, and I want to go just a step further with it and talk a little bit more about allyship. So this is something Sean and I think about a lot as to white kids in Seattle, just in really trying to think about the privilege that we have and the voices that we put behind the mic on the podcast and how we go about doing that. But to all of our listeners out there that are allies in other ways too, that have privilege around some aspects of their identity, I guess, what does allyship look like to you and how would we be good allies to you? You know, it's interesting because um, right now the reason I'm in Seattle is I'm on a tour promoting a new book by PM Press called Love and Struggle by David Gilbert. And David is a white anti-imperialist political prisoner who has done 30 years in maximum security prisons in this country for specifically working in support of the Black Liberation Movement. So he worked with the Black Liberation Army as a white ally and was captured during an attempted expropriation, which means an attempted bank robbery that went horribly wrong and several people died and was given um, 75 years in prison, even though he was the getaway driver and did not pull a weapon or shoot anyone. I think something that's incredibly powerful in this memoir, David, as a white upper class, nice Jewish kid, as the intro says, who was raised in the suburbs of Boston, who ends up working in support of revolutionary black liberation. I think the book is obviously exploring what does it mean to be an ally? What does it mean to support this work? And David was also part of the Weather Underground, which was a group of radical white youth who engaged in armed propaganda, which was blowing up and setting bombs in buildings that were significant political targets. Their bombings, they were always nonviolent, right? Which in this day and a nonviolent bombing, people are like, what is that? What? That makes no sense, right? But I just want to say, I would love to question the idea that blowing up a building is violence. I don't think you can do violence to a building. I'm not going to kick a chair and get charged with assault. So the Weather Underground engaged in armed propaganda specifically in support of liberation movements for folks of color. That was their whole purpose was as an anti-racist organization of young white folks to destroy and dismantle white supremacy. David does an incredible job of turning painfully critical eye. I was like, that is a laser beam, not only on the organization, but himself and really critiquing his own faults and mistakes. But I think what is incredible about Weather is, first of all, their commitment as an organization to anti-racism. They were the first grouping of white folks since John Brown to engage in armed struggle in support of liberation of people of color. It's a fairly big gap from, you know, 1850 to 1970, whatever. But I think the framing of it is incredibly important that they utilize because their framing was, yes, we are standing in solidarity and support of third world peoples. In fact, their founding statement by Bernadine Dort said, never again will black and brown people fight alone. But they also said, this is also for us. We are not just doing this because this is what is right for brown people. We are coming in and doing them a favor. We as white folks who want to be real human beings have to destroy white supremacy. We as white folks who believe a revolution is necessary globally have to fight against white supremacy because otherwise the world that we want to see, in this case their world, it was a socialist world, will never come to fruition if we do not attack and destroy white supremacy, right? So I feel like it's, it's an incredibly useful framing that has gotten lost, where we become allies because it's the right thing to do, rather than saying, this is actually something that is in not only my interests, but the interests of everyone I love, and it will move me closer to the world that I want to live in and the world I want to see. I think it connects back again to the Audre Lorde Safe Outside of the System project of saying, when you center those folks who are most marginalized, and when those folks are supported and safe and whole and held by the community, all of us are safer and wholer for it. And so, I mean, I think ally is a useful word for folks to think about their own privilege and their own position, but I also would challenge folks to say that to not think of this as someone else's struggle, that it's, it's our struggle, right? 
I actually worked for an organization, a regional organization based in Portland called Western State Center in the program called Uniting Communities that focused on raising up the visibility experiences and needs of queer and trans people of color in communities of color. And we really challenged organizations of color to say, this is, this is actually not you being an ally. This is you fulfilling your mission. Your mission is to raise up everyone in your community, right? It's to you know make sure everyone has quality education, quality healthcare, quality housing, whatever it is. Well, then this is your issue, right? You're not being an ally to queer and trans people of color in your community. You're actually doing what you said you were doing. And if you decide not to support queer and trans folks of color in your community and deal with the unique disparities that folks are dealing with, you are deciding not to fulfill the mission and not to work towards the world that you want to see. Again, ally is really useful to be clear and say, you know, I do have privilege in this, but I also think we have to hold being an ally withholding this is my fight right and that this is going to make me the person i want to be and make the world that i want to live in and i am deeply and personally invested in that not for someone else but for me i really appreciate what you said and i'm going to think about it a lot and listen to it and it just makes me think with organizing the whole point is to like make that human connection it's all based on that and it's like people together and i feel like it just makes that part more tangible to me because I am always probably hypersensitive of privilege and always trying to sort of hold back and get the voices to the forefront, the ones that haven't typically been heard. But sometimes I'm wondering, being in that sense more together and having more of like a collective around it and just thinking about it. I don't know, I think that that will help me sort of evolve my sense of what that is. So I really appreciate that you said that. What I think it brings up for me is like the idea of how careful we need to be and how thoughtful we need to be when building movements in general because it's so easy for us to just reference what we already know and what we already know is what's wrong mm -hmm. and so we see an idea or we see a certain population that has disparities or obstacles and we of course want to look at that and our first things to do is fix the problem but we really have no reference of what it looks like to not have a problem mm -hmm. and so that we have to continually be checking in and rethinking to illustrate a good example originally some organizations were really looking at like how folks are treated in prisons and they were really thinking about how can we get more of a like humane treatment and like some you know other amenities and by winning right by being successful and helping that group they actually just put more money and truly ended up building like another prison because of course we need more space mm -hmm. so we having to be really thoughtful and that was like an error that folks made and kind of realized that and are careful not to do that again but i think that that's one of the things that as any kind of like organizer or ally you have to always be checking in with like well what's the long-term goal of this no that the stuff that you're doing right now how does that contribute to the success of dismantling it long term mm -hmm. because abolition is not going to happen tomorrow it is more of a strategic long term i see it as like dismantling a lot of these oppressive systems are our vision and and we need the visionaries to like remind us that that's where we're going so everything we do every day doesn't get us backwards from that it's interesting too because i don't know you probably have heard about this, but Seattle is sort of up in arms right now about building a new juvenile detention facility. And the prime reason is because the old one is falling apart and there's all these issues with the building. And so they need this more humane, clean, nice jail to send kids to jail. And it's like, wait a, wait a minute, like, how about we not send kids to jail at all? And why don't we do something else altogether? And some of our county council did a panel and it just sort of went awry and it, it wasn't necessarily a conversation. It just, it, from my perspective, it wasn't like good organizing on how it all went about, but that highlights sort of a local thing that's happening right now that is important. And if we build a nice new jail, what are we saying and how are we getting ourselves further from the ultimate goal of like getting rid of this mm -hmm. altogether? Yeah, I mean, I think that's really important. And I mean, specifically on the juvenile jail piece, one of the things that David talks about in his book, Love and Struggle, is about going back and, and studying, right? And that we just really need to study and we really need to uncover these histories and these examples that have been purposely hidden from us, right? I mean, in 1974, all of the juvenile jails were eliminated in Massachusetts. There was not a single youth in jail anymore. And it was this process, a multi-year process the new commissioner who came in and he wrote a great book I think it's called last one over the wall and he said 
you know, when I came in, I, I didn't expect to want to abolish the system. I figured I could reform it. But after seeing how corrupt it was, I realized there was nothing but to completely dismantle it. And so he worked at trying to get youth sent into any other program, you know, sending them to art camp or outward bound or rehabilitation or whatever programs. And, you know, in his book, he's like, it probably was not legal <laughs> some of the choice <laughs> some of the things i did and he's like but i would rather deal with the flack and not have kids in prison and when you look at the recidivism rates there was a drop in recidivism there was a drop in juvenile you know folks going back into prison and there was no spike in juvenile crime at all so obviously breaking down a lot of the myths that we get told about, you know, what will happen if we don't have prisons to keep us safe. But I think so many people don't even know that for a number of years, there was no juvenile detention facility in Massachusetts, right? And sadly, it didn't last. Massachusetts has reinstituted the system. But we have these examples of these moments that we can hold up and say, what can we learn from this moment and how can we expand on it? But only if we are able to go back and study and reclaim that. You know, I think it's so important to be able to hold that, you know, we have to address people's everyday needs and the issues that folks are dealing with today. And we have to do that in a way, like you said, that ultimately dismantles the system and doesn't reinforce it, right? And so teach a class on the Black Panther Party and, you know, the Black Panther Party, people may not know, but they actually fed more children with their breakfast program than the United States government did, right? The reason we have free and reduced lunches is because the government was being shamed by the Black Panther Party that had no money coming in. They were getting day old bread from folks and they fed 10,000 children every day across this country, right? But they had many programs like this. They had health clinics, dental clinics, clothing give giveaways, basically whatever the community needed the Panthers worked to empower the community to help provide, but they were called survival programs, but survival pending revolution programs, right? So if the Panthers had just said, well, we're just gonna help you get food and we're just gonna help you, you know, I, we're just gonna feed these kids. That is not changing the system, right? That is actually just meaning that the state doesn't have to worry about doing that. But because the Panthers put it in a revolutionary context and utilize those moments to raise consciousness of the community to the real reasons why they were in that situation and why their children had to go to the breakfast program to get a decent meal and why they weren't making enough money to be able to provide it. Because the Panthers were able to utilize that moment to help the community raise their consciousness that is the really radical potential of that program. And it was also the reason the Panthers were called the biggest threat to internal security in America by the FBI director, J. Edgar Hoover. He said that directly after they started the, the breakfast program. And he targeted the breakfast program as dangerous and as subversive because it was winning support for the Panthers in the community and winning support for folks to say, we can actually take care of our own needs. We don't need to constantly beg the system to do this for us. We can empower ourselves we can have self-determination you know and i think we've lost that it's hard to find that balance but it's incredibly important to have that pending whatever <laughs> pending the larger world that we want to see right because if we lose that then what we're doing is we're running on the hamster wheel right, right. we're just on the treadmill so we really appreciate uh, again walita you coming on the podcast we feel really lucky that you're here and just in closing out um, our episode with you just any final remarks from you and then if there's anything you want to say about some of the performance work that you're doing or anything else you want to add yeah no i'm i'm really excited to be here and i'm excited to be able to have these conversations in this context so thank y'all for having me you know i was just thinking about question about you know how do i maintain hope basically and i think for me as as an artist as a poet it definitely is intimately connected to to the creation process and being able to share that with other folks and being able to hear other people's artwork and i think our movements don't movements for social justice often downplay the role of art but art has played a significant role in any successful 
social change, uprising, revolution, right? Because that's what feeds people's spirits, you know? When I've had a horrible day and I just feel like I can't go on, I don't go home and listen to a three hour speech, right? <laughs> I go home and I put on, you know, I put on some Curtis Mayfield or I go home and read an Audre Lorde poem. And, you know, I go to these things that are a different way of knowing. And I think it's really important to frame it in that way, not as, oh, well, that's, you know, that's the heart and it's different from the head. To me, art is a different way of knowing things. It's a different way of being able to engage and make sense of the world around us. So I think that has been something that has been incredibly important to me to keep sustaining my hope. I think the process of creation keeps me able to think about creating a new world. So I actually have a, an amazing opportunity in two days on Thursday. I'm going to be in the Bay Area with this event called Undocunation. And so it's an evening of artists for immigrant justice. And it's pulling together regional artists as a response to SB 1070 and the criminalization of immigrants, but also, you know, talking about everything we've been talking about here, really criminalized identities and those intersections using art. And I think, again, it's such a powerful medium, you know, I think especially when we're talking about immigration, where people literally are speaking different languages and yet we can look at a painting together we can watch a film and even if i can't understand the words i can feel that right we can listen to a piece of music and again i can feel that voice and that emotion and that way of knowing even if i don't understand every single word and i think for me it's been an amazing opportunity to get to work with so many incredible artists and really getting to relearn the central need that we all have for art, whether we know it or not. That wraps up episode 27, our interview on the roots and foundations of the prison industrial complex and so very much more with Walida Imarisha. And this is GenderCast signing off. Thank you so much again. 2012 GenderCast, our trans masculine gender query. All podcasts, content, and information related to these podcasts are the property of GenderCast producers and may not be used without their written consent. Contact GenderCast at gmail.com for written permission. I am just one into this world, but what the world might see isn't always me. Cause inside is a boy trying to break free. body or my soul he just wants to share this body make me whole cause the girl this world does see is only half of me i am not the only one born under this golden sun beneath the surface you will find the million thoughts that cross my mind I am born into this world brand new Start with knowledge small, takes time to learn it all Learn to live, leave it all behind Except the different and find the peace of mind make us who we are what we know some of us are scared to let it show let it out scream this is me now it's time let the whole world see Cross my mind, a million paths that can 